Hi, my name is Karen, and I'm an American lay student of Ajahn Sachat, or Pra Ajahn Sachat Abhijato, who has given me the very special honor of being asked by him to record this book for you. This book was written by Pra Ajahn Sachat's own teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mahabua Nyanasampano, and is a spiritual biography written by him about his teacher, the Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara. The title of the book is Venerable Acharya Mun Buridatta Tara, a spiritual biography by Acharya Mahabua Jnana Sampano. And it was published in 2005, translated into English by Bhikkhu Dick Silaritano. If you would like to learn how to download or get a hard copy of this book, or a list of which pages or chapters are read on each separate recording, please listen to the beginning of the first recording of this book. This book, in any form, is to be given away for free. Any ads you may see or hear in this recording have been put there by the platform you are using to listen or view with for its own revenue in exchange for letting us use their platform for free. Please forgive me for any mispronunciations of names, places, or words, as I'm still learning how to pronounce Thai and Pali, and for any background noises, as I'm just making these recordings in my apartment with an unruly dog and in the middle of a city. Oh, we're resuming today on page 22. Uh, this is the sixth recording and uh, we are in the first chapter and we're still in the subsection that is titled Acharya Sao Cantasilo. Shortly after his ordination, Acharya Mun began wandering to Tonga in Nakhon Phanom province and eventually crossed the Mekong River to enter Laos, where he contentedly practiced the ascetic way of life in the mountainous district of Ta Kek. This area of Laos abounded in large, ferocious tigers, huge beasts that were considered far more vicious than tigers on the Thai side of the mountain. Repeatedly, they attacked and killed the local inhabitants and then feasted on their flesh. Despite such brutality, those people, mostly of Vietnamese descent, weren't nearly as afraid of tigers as were their Lao and Thai neighbors. Time and again, they watched these terrible beasts attack and kill friends and relatives. Yet, they seemed indifferent to the carnage. Having seen a friend killed right in front of them, the flesh torn from the body by a hungry tiger, the people would casually venture back into that same tiger-infested forest the next day, as though nothing had happened. The Lao and Thai communities would have been extremely upset, but the Vietnamese seemed strangely unmoved by such occurrences. Perhaps they were so accustomed to seeing such things that it no longer affected them. The Vietnamese had another strange habit. When they saw a man-eating tiger suddenly leap out to attack one of their companions, no one in the group made any effort to save their friend's life. They simply abandoned their friend to his fate and ran for their lives. Suppose a group were sleeping in the forest overnight. If a huge tiger leaped into the campsite and dragged one of them away, the others, awakened by the noise, would jump up and run away, and then calmly find another place close by to sleep. Like children, they acted without much rhyme or reason in these matters. They behaved as though those huge beasts, which had already shown themselves to be so adept at devouring human flesh, were somehow too stupid to do the same to them. I am also familiar with people who have no proper fear of tigers. When coming to live in our country, they like to settle in dense, overgrown jungle areas abounding in tigers and other wild animals. Venturing deep into the forest in search of timber, they then spend the night there far from the village, showing no signs of fear at all. Even alone, these people can sleep deep in the forest at night without fear. If they wish to return to the village late at night, they have no qualms about walking alone through the dense undergrowth and back, if necessary. 
If asked why they aren't afraid of tigers, their response is that while the huge tigers in their own country have a taste for human flesh, Thai tigers don't, and that they're even scared of people. Conditions can be so dangerous in their homeland that people staying overnight in the forest must build an enclosure to sleep in that resembles a pigsty. Otherwise, they might never return home. Even within the precincts of some village communities, prowling tigers can be so fierce that no one dares leave home after dark, fearing an attack by a tiger leaping out of the shadows. The Vietnamese even chide the Thais for being such cowardly people, always entering the forest in groups, never daring to venture out alone. For these reasons, Acharya Mun claimed that the Vietnamese lacked an instinctive fear of tigers. When Acharya Mun crossed into their country, however, the tigers there never bothered him. Camped in the forest, he often saw their tracks and heard their roars echoing through the trees at night. However, he never felt personally threatened by such things. They were simply natural aspects of forest life. In any case, Achari Aman wasn't worried about tigers so much as he worried about the possibility that he might not transcend Dukkha and realize the supreme happiness of Nibbana in his lifetime. When speaking of his excursions crossing the Mekong River, he never mentioned being afraid. He obviously considered such dangers to be a normal part of trekking through the wilds. If I had been faced with those same dangers instead of Achari Aman, surely the local villagers would have had to form a posse to rescue this cowardly Dutanga monk. When I'm walking in meditation in the forest at night, just the occasional roar of a tiger so unsettles me that I can barely manage to keep walking to the end of the track. I fear coming face to face with one of those beasts and losing my wits. You see, since becoming old enough to understand such things, I always heard my parents and their neighbors vociferously proclaim that tigers are very fierce animals and extremely dangerous. This notion has stuck with me ever since, making it impossible not to be terrified of tigers. I must confess that I've never found a way to counteract this tendency. Achari Amun spent most of the early years of his monastic career traveling at length through the various provinces of Thailand's northeast region. Later, as he developed enough inner stability to withstand both external distractions and those mercurial mental traits that were so much a part of his character, he walked down into the central provinces, wandering contentedly across the central plains region living the Dutanga lifestyle until eventually he reached the capital, Bangkok. Arriving shortly before the rainy season, he went to Wat Patamwan Monastery and entered the retreat there. During the rains retreat, he made a point of regularly going to seek advice from Chao Kung Upali Gunupama Chariya at Wat Boromaniwat Monastery to gain more extensive techniques for developing wisdom. Achari Amun left Bangkok following the rains retreat, hiking to Lot Buri province to stay a while at Pai Kwang Cave in the Pra Nyam mountain range before moving on to Singto Cave. Life in such favorable locations give him an excellent uninterrupted opportunity to fully intensify his spiritual practice. In doing so, he developed a fearless attitude toward his mind and the things with which it came in contact. By then, his samadhi was rock solid. Using it as the firm basis for his practice, he examined everything from the perspective of Dhamma, continually uncovering new techniques for developing wisdom. After a suitable interval, he returned to Bangkok, once again visiting Chao Kun Upali at Wat Boromaniwa. He informed his mentor of developments in his meditation practice, questioning him about doubts he still had concerning the practice of wisdom. Satisfied that the new investigative techniques he had learned were sufficient to further his progress, he finally took leave of Khao Kun Upali and left to seek seclusion at Sarika Cave in the Khao Yai Mountains of Nakhon Nayak province. And we're moving to page 25 which begins a new subsection called Sarika Cave. 
Acharya Man spent three years living and practicing in Sarika Cave. His entire stay there was filled with the most unusual experiences, making it a memorable episode in his life. To the best of my recollection, he first arrived at Bandue village, the village nearest the cave, and thus close enough to be convenient for alms round. Unfamiliar with the area, he asked the villagers to take him to Sarika Cave. Straight away, they warned him that it was a very special cave possessing numerous supernatural powers, insisting that no monk could possibly live there unless his virtue was pure. Other monks who had tried to live there quickly fell ill with a variety of painful symptoms. Many had even died before they could be brought down for treatment. They told him that the cave was the domain of a spirit of immense size possessing many magical powers. It also had a very foul temper. This giant spirit guarded the cave from all intruders, monks being no exception. Unexpected occurrences awaited all intruders into the cave, many of whom ended up dead. The spirit delighted in testing any monk who came bragging about his mastery of magic spells for warding off spirits. Invariably, the monk would suddenly fall ill and die a premature death. Fearing that Acharya Mun might die likewise, the villagers pleaded with him not to go. Curious about the talk of a huge malevolent spirit with supernatural powers, Acharya Mun asked and was told that a trespasser usually saw some sign of those powers on the very first night. An ominous dream often accompanied fitful sleep. An enormous black spirit towering overhead, threatened to drag the dreamer to his death, shouting that he had long been the cave's guardian, exercising absolute authority over the whole area and would allow no one to trespass. So any trespasser was immediately chased away, for it accepted no authority greater than its own, except that of a person of impeccable virtue and a loving, compassionate heart who extended these noble qualities to all living beings. A person of such nobility was allowed to live in the cave. The spirit would even protect him and pay him homage. But it did not tolerate narrow-minded, selfish, ill-behaved intruders. Finding life in the cave a very uncomfortable experience, most monks refused to remain for long, and fearing death, they made a hurried departure. Generally, no one managed a long stay, only one or two days at most, and they were quickly on their way. Trembling and almost out of their minds with fear as they climbed back down, they blurted out something about a fierce demonic spirit. Scared and chastened, they fled, never to return. Worse still, some who went up to the cave never came back down again. Thus, the villagers worried about the fate that awaited Acharya Mun, not wanting him to become the next victim. Acharya Mun asked what they meant by saying that some monks went up there never to return. Why hadn't they come down again? He was told that having died there, they couldn't possibly come back down. They recounted a story of four seemingly competent monks who had died in the cave not long before. Prior to entering the cave, one of them had assured the villagers that he was impervious to fear for he knew a potent spell that protected him against ghosts and other spirits, plus many other potent spells as well. He was convinced no spirit could threaten him. Warning him repeatedly about the dangers, the villagers tried to discourage his intentions, but he reiterated that he had no fear and insisted on being taken to the cave. The villagers were left with no other choice, so they showed him the way. Once there, he came down with a variety of afflictions, including high fevers, pounding headaches, and terrible stomach pains. Sleeping fitfully, he dreamt that he was being taken away to his death. Over the years, many different monks had tried to live there, but their experiences were strikingly similar. Some died, others quickly fled. The four most recent monks died within a relatively short period. The villagers couldn't guarantee that their deaths were caused by a malevolent spirit, Perhaps there was another reason, but they had always noticed a powerful presence connected with the cave. 
Local people weren't so bold as to challenge its power, but they were wary of it and envisioned themselves being carried back down in critical condition or as corpses. Acharya Mun questioned them further to satisfy himself that they were telling the truth. They assured him that such things happened so often it frightened them to think about it. For this reason they warned any monk or lay person who came to search the cave for magical objects or sacred amulets. Whether the cave actually contained such things is another matter, but the fact that some people liked to claim their existence meant that those with a penchant for sacred objects inevitably went there to search for them. The villagers themselves had never seen such objects in the cave, nor had they seen those seeking them encounter anything but death or narrow escapes from death. Thus, fearing for Acharya Mun's safety, they begged him not to go. Acharya Mun gave the villagers a sympathetic hearing, but in the end, he was still curious to see the cave. Live or die, he wanted to put himself to the test and so discover the truth of those stories. The scary tales he heard didn't frighten him in the least. In truth, he saw this adventure as a means to arouse mindfulness, an opportunity to acquire many new ideas for contemplation. He possessed the courage to face whatever was to happen, as befits someone genuinely interested in seeking the truth. So in his own unassuming way, he informed the villagers that although the stories were very frightening, he still would like to spend some time in the cave, assuring them that he would hurry back down at the first sign of trouble. He asked to be escorted to the cave, which they obligingly did. For several days, Acharya Mun's physical condition remained normal, his heart calm and serene. The environment around the cave was secluded and very quiet, disturbed only by the natural sounds of wild animals foraging for food in the forest. He passed the first few nights contentedly, but on subsequent nights, he began to suffer stomach pains. Although such pains were nothing new, this time the condition grew steadily worse, eventually becoming so severe that he sometimes passed blood in his stool. Before long, his stomach refused to digest food properly. It simply passed straight through. This made him reflect on what the villagers had said about four monks dying there recently. If his condition didn't improve, Perhaps he would be the fifth. When lay people came to see him at the cave one morning, he sent them to look in the forest for certain medicinal plants that he had previously found beneficial. They gathered various roots and wood essences, which he boiled into a potion and drank, or else ground into powder, drinking it dissolved in water. He tried several different combinations of herbs, but none relieved his symptoms. They worsened with each passing day. His body was extremely weak, and though his mental resolve was not greatly affected, it was clearly weaker than normal. As he sat drinking the medicine one day, a thought arose, which, prompting a self-critical examination, reinforced his resolve. I've been taking this medicine now for many days. If it really is an effective stomach cure, then I should see some positive results by now but every day my condition worsens. Why isn't this medicine having the desired effect? Perhaps it's not helping at all. Instead, it may be aggravating the symptoms and so causing the steady deterioration. If so, why continue taking it? Once he became fully aware of his predicament, he made an emphatic decision. From that day on, he would treat his stomach disorder using only the therapeutic properties of Dhamma. If he lived, so much the better. If he died, then so be it. Conventional types of treatment proving ineffective, he determined to stop taking all medicines until he was cured by Dhamma's therapeutic powers or else died there in the cave. With this firm resolution in mind, he reminded himself, I'm a Buddhist monk. I've certainly practiced meditation long enough to recognize the correct path leading to Maga, Pala, and Nibbana. By now, my practice should be firmly anchored in this conviction. So why am I so weak and cowardly when faced with a small degree of pain? It's only a slight pain after all, yet I can't seem to come to grips with it. Becoming weak all of a sudden, I now feel defeated. 
Later, when life reaches a critical juncture, at the moment of death as the body begins to break up and disintegrate, the onslaught of pain will then crush down mercilessly on body and mind. Where shall I find the strength to fight it so I can transcend this world and avoid being outdone in death's struggle? With this solemn determination, he stopped taking all medicines and began earnestly focusing on meditation as the sole remedy for all spiritual and bodily ailments. Discarding concern for his life, he let his body follow its own natural course, turning his attention to probing the chitta, that essential knowing nature which never dies, it has death as its constant companion. He set to work examining the chitta, using the full powers of mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and perseverance that had been developing within himself for so long. The seriousness of his physical condition ceased to interest him. Concerns about death no longer arose. He directed mindfulness and wisdom to investigate the painful feelings he experienced, making them separate the body into its constituent elements, and then thoroughly analyzing each one. He examined the physical components of the body and the feelings of pain within it. He analyzed the function of memory, which presumes that one or another part of the body is in pain. And he analyzed the thought processes which conceived the body as being in pain. All such vital aspects were targeted in the investigation conducted by mindfulness and wisdom as they continued to probe into the body, the pain, and the chitta, relentlessly exploring their connections from dusk until midnight. Through this process, he succeeded in fully disengaging the body from the severe pain caused by his stomach disorder until he understood with absolute clarity just how they are interrelated. At that moment of realization, his chitta converged into complete calm, a moment that saw his spiritual resolve immeasurably strengthened and his bodily illness totally vanish. The illness, the pain, the mind's preoccupations all disappeared simultaneously. And we're going to end there today. I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger uh, in the next paragraph. Um, this section just continues too long to continue uh, with it in this recording. But in the starting of the very next paragraph, uh, Acharya Mun encounters the giant spirit. So stay tuned. We are on page 29, roughly in the middle of it. And we'll continue on page 29 in the next recording. I'll see you then with Metta. Bye-bye.